The top business story is live from the Sky News City studio. A warning from John Lewis that its turnaround will take two years longer than expected. I'll be speaking to its chair, Dame Sharon White. Eurozone interest rates hit an all-time high as the European Central Bank announces its tenth hike in a row. But will it be the last? Plus, Cambridge-based chip designer Arm Holdings floats in the United States in Wall Street's biggest IPO for two years. Good afternoon. This is Business Live with me, Ian King. The European Central Bank has this afternoon raised interest rates for the Eurozone for the tenth consecutive time, taking its main policy rate from three and three quarter percent to four percent, the highest it's been since the creation of the Euro in 1999. Explaining the decision, the ECB said Eurozone inflation, which was 5.3 percent in August, was still expected to remain too high for too long. It raised its inflation forecast for this year and next, while also cutting its growth forecasts for this year and next. The fight that we are leading, we're not the only one, but the fight that we're leading against inflation is making progress. And what we're doing today is trying to reinforce that progress. Is it satisfactory? No. Because it, it, it is and it is expected by our projection to still remain too high and for too long. But inflation has declined and we want it to continue to decline. The Sky's economics editor Ed Conway is with me. Ed, uh, not without risks this move from the ECB, not least with the fact that Germany, the Eurozone's biggest economy, is in recession. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, we're starting to see both in the Eurozone and in the UK, for that matter, because it's a similar story here as well. We're seeing the impact of higher interest rates, as well as all of the other headwinds that, that, that many of these economies are facing. So in particular, in Germany, really high energy prices, because they're still pretty high compared with the post-Russian uh, invasion uh, story. Uh, those high energy prices are still weighing down, particularly on the industrial side of the, uh, of the economies. But then add to that the fact that you've got these higher interest rates uh, in the Eurozone, uh, now up to 4%, uh, the highest level that they have ever been. But I think the other big story is that now you've got economists wondering whether this is the last. So a lot of economists thinking that that may well have been the last increase in the Eurozone. Uh, similarly, in the UK, most economists think the Bank of England will raise interest rates by another quarter percentage point, potentially, uh, the majority of them thinking that's going to come as soon as next week. But again, thinking perhaps that might be the end of it. Uh, and we are now potentially, according to, to those economists, at that point where interest rates are kind of at that peak. But here's the issue. It takes quite a while for those interest rates to start to filter through through to the economy. We're seeing it in the UK. You know, fixed rate mortgages, they only go up, you know, when you have to refix. And that means it's a gradual impact. Gradually, millions of households are seeing their mortgages increase quite dramatically. But that doesn't happen overnight. And as a result, you're starting to see recessionary uh, impacts coming through in the UK and many other countries aside. It's worth just saying, you know, we've had some pretty uh, dismal figures on the economy just in the latest month, the GDP numbers this week. Um, however, when you take a step back and just look at the big picture, essentially the country and economic growth is just flatlining at the moment. And it's a similar story for much of the Eurozone as well. And so I think, you know, the big question now is most central banks think that interest rates are kind of getting close to their peak. The question then is going to be how long do they stay high? Because at that level, both the ECB and the Bank of England say that it is actually bearing down on the economy. It is causing pain. And that pain isn't really going away, given that, as I say, it's a gradual process. And so we're likely to see high interest rates for quite some time. And as a result of that, that's going to depress economic growth in the Eurozone and the, in the UK uh, for some time to come. OK, Ed, thanks for that. Now, the British chip designer Arm Holdings, which is based in Cambridge, has this afternoon floated in New York in the biggest IPO of the year. Well, shares started trading on the Nasdaq a couple of hours ago. High demand from investors meant it was able to sell the 95.5 million shares on offer, which is a 9.4% stake in the company. At the top end of a lowered price range, the IPO is the biggest for Wall Street since Rivian's stock market debut in 2021. Between 2016 and now, we diversified our business. We've got significant growth in the cloud data center and in automotive. And then with AI, uh, AI runs on ARM. 
Uh, it's hard to find an AI device today that isn't ARM-based. Uh, Google Alexa, excuse me, Amazon Alexa, for, for example. That device, which uh, does voice recognition, et cetera, that's AI. And what we see happening going forward is products that didn't have a CPU to run AI, they'll need AI. Uh, you might need more CPUs uh, to run more complex AI. So we see just huge growth opportunities there. Well, we're still waiting for the first trade to go through in ARM Holdings. They were priced at $51 a share. They've been indicated higher at 58 but as I say, no trades have actually gone through yet. We'll keep you posted on what's happening there. To some other stories now, though, and the German supermarket operator Lidl's UK operations have gone into the red as a result of cutting prices, opening more stores and awarding staff pay rises. Lidl's UK arm reported a pre-tax loss of £75.9 million for the year to the end of February, that compared with a pre-tax profit of £41.1 million during the previous 12 months. Lidl opened 50 new UK stores during the period, taking it to 960, while raising staff pay cost it £50 million. Shares of THG fell by 16% after the online retailer reported that operating losses for the six months to the end of June widened to £99.5 million from £89.2 million in the same period last year. But the company, formerly known as the Hutt Group, insisted this was due to a one-off charge following a decision to dispose of non-core assets and loss-making discontinued categories. It said sales trends were improving and especially in its beauty division after the end of a period of significant destocking across the industry. America's big three Detroit-based car makers, Ford, General Motors and Chrysler's parent Stellantis, are bracing themselves for strikes as negotiations with the United Auto Workers Union appear to have stalled. The UAW has pledged walkouts at individual car plants if new deals on paying conditions are not reached by midnight tonight. Ford is reported to have offered a 20% pay rise over the next four and a half years, General Motors 18% and Stellantis 17.5%. But the union is demanding 40%. It also wants a restoration of defined benefit pensions, a 32-hour working week and an end to the use of temporary workers. Well, if you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can read my analysis on this dispute. That's available right now on our digital platforms. Do have a look at that if you can. Well, the euro sold off against the US dollar this afternoon after the market decided the European Central Bank statement today means it will not raise interest rates further. The single currency, as you can see, off by nearly two-thirds of one percent against the greenback, more or less unchanged against the pound. Sterling, meanwhile, off uh, nearly two-thirds against the uh, greenback as well. A bit of a dollar strength uh, right now. Well, and on the equity market, stocks in Europe have rallied on that news. All of the uh, continental European indices all finishing way above uh, one percent in most cases. Uh, very, very solid afternoon indeed. Here in London, similar story in the FTSE 100. Look at that, the FTSE uh, just shy of 2%. Uh, I'm not sure that's a closing price yet. There's still the uh, closing auction going on as we speak, so that might not be the definitive closing price as we speak there. It's been a broad-based rally led by all the mining heavyweights that are trading higher on the back of higher metals prices. Anglo-American, the uh, top blue-chip gainer, Look at that, seven and three quarter percent higher on the session. Other blue chip gainers include Flutter Entertainment, the owner of Paddy Power and Betfair. That's up four and a half percent after it received a push from one of the brokers. Outside the FTSE, Trainline has chuffed ahead some 11 percent on a trading update, while the music catalogue's investor Hypnosis Songs Fund is one percent of the good after selling some song catalogues to its investment advisor. Over on Wall Street, all of the main stock indices are trading higher this afternoon, apart from mine arm um, holes. Uh, the main topic of focus again is the uh, mining stocks on uh, higher metals prices. Freeport McMoran, which is a big US copper producer, its shares are ahead by some 3% right now. As for the oil price, well, that remains close to a 10 month high. In fact, that is a new 10 month high. That is uh, taking us back, I believe, to around the 16th of November last year. Barrel of Brent crude currently changing hands at $93.60 a barrel. That is up just under 2% on the session. Well, joining me today is Alex Funk. He's Chief Investment Officer at Schroeder Investment Solutions. Alex, good to see you this afternoon. Great to be here. Thank you. What a session. Yeah, absolutely. And I think over the last couple of days, we've had loads of economic data. But to sort of understand how the market is unpacking this, we almost have to take a little step back and say, well, we came into 2023 thinking 
We had had seen 400 basis points of rate hikes in the US. The market has to suffer. There has to be a recession. And lo and behold, everyone underestimated the strength of the US consumer. So I think what we've been out on the lookout for is to say, well, what signs can we see how the US consumer is behaving? How much of that excess savings is still left? And then is there this risk of a second round inflation effect ultimately? And I think that's what's giving most central banks a bit of a headache, right? It's around services inflation, spending away from goods, going on holidays. Clearly, um, you know, the oil price that we just discussed is not helpful at this point in time. So we're seeing interesting effects off of the back of that. Well, that's right. I mean, we have the US inflation data last night, came in higher than expected. Obviously, there's been this uh, move higher in oil prices over the last few weeks. I mean, that, that has all sorts of implications for the Bank of England here in the UK, of course. Yeah, but if we just even think about it in the US for a second, there's some base effects that have rolled over, right? So I think going from sort of 8% or 9% inflation to 3 or even 4% inflation, that's almost the easy part. How do you get that sticky components uh, of inflation to move down? How do you reduce that uh, second round effects that we've just discussed? And I think clearly that's what the Fed is on the lookout for. So we've seen some retail sales data come out. Yes, it's strong again today, but we forget about the revisions that's now been applied in July. So net net, you know, is there a softening in demand? Uh, a question still to be seen, and I think we'll be, you know, sort of hawkish on having a look at what that, uh, how that plays out as we go forward. But it's all about real wage growth at the moment. How do consumers react? Does US companies, UK companies, European companies sort of sustain this period of higher rates, higher inflation? through ultimately consumer demand. Mm. What did you make of the ECB's uh, statement this lunchtime? I mean, not terribly good news. They downgraded their growth forecast again as well. I mean, th there's not much to inspire there, really. Absolutely. I mean, you've got a manufacturing sector that is clearly in slowdown. You've got higher stubborn inflation and you've got rate hikes now at the highest level. Right. And so that creates a very difficult cocktail, I think, for investors, because you can clearly see the slowing effect coming through. But you Central banks really can't afford the mistake of being wrong about inflation again. I mean, if we just sort of roll back to this idea of transitory inflation, right, that clearly was an error in most cases. I'd say, except for probably emerging markets, which we can touch on a bit as well. But ultimately, developed markets can't get it wrong again. And so there is this risk of over-tightening. I think it's more pertinent potentially in Europe. I think we have to keep a key eye on these large manufacturing sectors of Well, you mentioned emerging markets. So, I mean, uh, some of the data that's come out of China over the last few days has been encouraging-ish, hasn't it? I think the stimulus is there, but it's not enough. And so I think what China is trying to aim for is n growth, but not the big bank stimulus approach that the Western world is. So let's call it more organic growth, if you like. Uh, the market clearly wants more. You know, us as investors always want lots of stimulus, lots of support. It floats risk assets up, it keeps bond yields intact. It's the Goldilocks scenario, ultimately. But that's clearly not what China is going for. So we're seeing, definitely we're seeing support. We're seeing a little bit more of that drip through. But I don't think it is a fast, sharp recovery. And, and there's probably more problems there. All right, Alex, we can leave it there, I'm afraid. Great to see you this Super. afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Still to come here on Business Live, I'm going to be speaking with Dame Sharon White, the chair of the John Lewis Partnership after today. Maud, its turnaround will take two years longer than expected. Don't go away.
I'm Greg Milam and I'm Sky's Chief North of England Correspondent. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. The five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. It's like better. Fly Emirates. Fly better. Thank you. Welcome back. A bit of breaking news to uh, bring you that's just reached us. In the last few minutes, West Yorkshire police have said they have made an arrest in connection with the malicious email which led to the closure of a number of schools in Leeds and Bradford earlier today. More on that news when we get it. Well, now, the John Lewis partnership warned today that its turnaround will take two years longer than expected to achieve. The owner of Britain's biggest department store chain and the Waitrose supermarket chain said a combination of inflationary pressures and greater than expected investment requirements meant the plan would now come to fruition in 2027-28 rather than in 2025-26. The partnership was reporting a pre-tax loss of £59 million for the 26 weeks to the 29th of July. That was a 41% improvement on the same period a year earlier. Total sales at the partnership rose by 2% to £5.8 billion. Pounds. Well, joining me now, I'm very pleased to say, is the chair of the John Lewis Partnership, Dame Sharon White. Uh, Sharon, great to see you and thanks very much for joining me on such a busy day for you. Um, just remind viewers, if you would please, what, what you're trying to achieve with this partnership plan. Um, so the plan, as you say, um, it will take us a couple, of, a couple more years than we'd hoped because of inflation and investment. But where we're trying to get to at the end of the period is um, essentially what we call sort of sufficient profit in the in the partnership, which is a four hundred million pounds profit, which as a mutual as a membership organisation is enough money for us to invest in our customers, um, do what we uh, need to do for our partners in terms of their development and pay, return to bonus, uh, and also uh, support our um, local communities, whether that's some of the work we're doing at the moment tackling food poverty or supporting young people into care. Worth pointing out that actually both John Lewis and Waitrose are trading profitably right now. It, it's, it's, it looks like the finance charges uh, are really weighing on the partnership's finances overall. Um, you're right. I mean, if, if I look at the half, um, actually, I'm, I'm really pleased with um, the improvement. So the, the, the cash that's being generated by John Lewis and Waitrose combined is about £100 million, which is a fivefold uh, improvement on this time last year. We have had some debt. Um, actually, our, our net debt is actually the lowest for um, a, a number of years. But we did take on debt um, for a big expansion between 2000 and 2019. So we're, we're trying to be prudent. But the underlying performance of the two brands um, uh, is actually very, very, very pleasing. And I think that's a, 
sign that we're delivering for customers. You know, 600,000 more customers shopped with us uh, in this half as, as compared to a year ago. Now, operating profits at uh, Waitrose were up uh, pretty substantially. You've invested £100 million in price there. Are you going to have to do that again in, in coming years? Um, so, uh, uh, most likely, what, what we're trying to do is, as the business becomes more efficient as well, you know, the way we operate becomes simpler and cheaper, we definitely want to use some of those savings to invest more in price. I mean, obviously, Waitrose, um, you know, we want to provide great value for our customers, but what's uh, why, why customers shop with Waitrose is, is value. So, you know, the ethics, the great taste, the sustainability, the, you know, animal welfare standards, which are the highest in the world. So we are, you know, we've got a particular place in the market, but we're also, you know, obviously conscious that, you know, cost of living pressures affect everybody. Everybody is, you know, is, is savvier. Uh, in shopping, and that that applies to, to to customers shopping in Waitrose too. So I, we'd love to do more if we're able to. And that certainly uh, showed up at John Lewis. I mean, it looks like some categories have been doing pretty well for you, like like beauty. But uh, it's some of these big ticket items that uh, aren't selling so many. It's exactly right. I think the John Lewis story this first half is a is a tale of two two parts. I think customers are spending on themselves. They're a bit more cautious about spending on their homes. So fashion's up nicely, um, beauty's up nicely. In fact, both trending at least in line with the market, if not a bit above. Uh, what's been much softer, in a sense, no surprise, in not least given where the housing market is, but those big ticket items, you know, sofas, you know, big, big dining uh, furniture, but also tech. And remember, obviously, lots of us replaced our Apple Macs, our tech, uh, during uh, COVID, and so uh, all of that sort of lasted a little bit longer, um, but very much in keeping with with the market. But we're finding that customers, you know, they they want to feel good, and they want to eat well, and we're providing as many opportunities as we can to to keep our customers, but also make sure that you know it's affordable quality. What kind of assumptions are you making for Christmas? I mean, obviously, as an economist, you know very well that all of the uh, impacts of the Bank of England's rate hikes have not yet fed through. What's Christmas going to look like this year, do you think? Yeah, so, I mean, Christmas is um, very important. Obviously, you know, families and um, people up and down the country, but it's very important uh, for the business. Three quarters of our profit comes through the last few weeks of the year. I mean, it's interesting. What we're finding is that customers are saying to us that they are saving money now in order to have a great uh, Christmas. And we're finding, um, you know, hits on the Christmas hub of John Lewis, uh, you know, it's up 30%. Um, we've got Santa's grottos in our John Lewis stores, 40,000 tickets, unbelievably, given the weather at the moment, 10,000 uh, tickets have sold, they're selling like hotcakes. So I'm expecting, without being complacent, because obviously there's a lot of uncertainty uh, mortgage rates rising potentially uh, further. There's a lot of uncertainty, but I, from what we see so far, um, we think it's going to be a very strong Christmas for us. And in addition, um, we've got some very significant efficiency savings, effectively already banked, which will come through to the tune of about a hundred million pounds over the course of the whole year. So, um, feeling 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 reasonably um, optimistic, cautiously optimistic. Uh, and certainly expecting the full year's performance this year to be stronger than last year. That's good. Now, uh, you've been uh, quite outspoken recently, along with other retailers, on the issue of shoplifting. I gather you spoke to Sir Mark Riley, the Met Police uh, Commissioner, early this week. What, what did he say to you? Yeah, we had a, we had a great um, conversation. I got a huge amount of respect for his leadership and... Obviously, he's a, he's a year into his role at the Met. I think sh um, sh being clear that we share the same priorities, uh, which is, you know, shoplifting, shoplifting can't be a crime that's, that's not followed up on. And at the moment, uh, you know, about three quarters of shoplifting cases for us in Waitrose and John Lewis, there's no police response. And I think he is uh, positively very keen to step forward on this. We're talking very specifically um, about um, whether technology can help. Um, so sometimes when you get a CCTV image of a, a alleged shoplifter, the image can be very fuzzy, very difficult to use, very difficult to use as evidence in a, in a, in a magistrate's court. There's some technology using AI 
that is now incredibly powerful, that's got the real potential um, to, um, you know, to then identify particularly pro prolific and repeat uh, offenders. And so that's an area that we're, we're, we're keen to, to collaborate on and, you know, provide safe spaces for our partners, also great, uh, great places for our customers to shop in. All right, so Sharon, there was loads more that I wanted to ask you, but we're out of time, I'm afraid. Do appreciate you joining me today. I know it's a really busy day for you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just before I go, uh, we're still uh, waiting on a first trade from Arm Holdings, uh, with Reuters are reporting at the moment that uh, we're expecting an opening price of around $56.51. Obviously, the IPO price was $51 uh, a share. Not untypical this. You quite often uh, have this with uh, Mar and Nasdaq uh, IPOs that uh, it takes a while for the first trade to go through. But uh, maybe this time tomorrow we'll be able to let you know what that is. Well, that's it from me. I'm back at 11.30 tomorrow morning. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Coming up next, it's Mark Austin. Thanks for joining me today. Cheerio.